Okay, Charlie, at this point, it looks like we have 18 uh, sign-ins, and I know several people are on in groups. So welcome so much to this, uh, our first webinar in the series, Navigating the Wilderness. We're really glad you're able to join us. And in true Connecticut conference fashion, um, I'm working out of my home office, and Charlie is at... Silver Lake Conference Center, your conference center. Yay! So he's taking a little bit of time out from deaning in order uh, to run this seminar with me. So delighted to have you with us. We'll go ahead and get going. Um, feel free to use the toolbar at the bottom to send chats if you have questions or use the Q&A. If you have questions, we'll try to get to those. Uh, either as we see them or towards the end, we do have some time for question and answer at the end as well. Charlie, go ahead. Uh, I am trying to advance. There we go. Here you go. So I'm going to give an overview of financial forecasting. And then Susie's going to talk about what you might do with the results of some forecasting and some learning. And then we'll do some questions and answers. It's not advancing. You got it to advance once. There you uh, go. Okay. Uh, and Susie introduced us. Uh, we are both conference staff members of longstanding. So, what do we mean by a fiscal cliff? If you are balancing your church budget by consuming unrestricted assets and run out of unrestricted assets, you may have no options left other than immediately cutting expenses. Here is a particularly dramatic recent example. A church adopted a 2019 budget with a deficit of $120,000 when they only had $120,000 in unrestricted assets left. In order to stay open in 2020, this church needs some combination of expense reductions and revenue increases that total $120,000. This is going over the fiscal cliff. The church does have a plan to survive, but it involves a dramatic reduction of staffing, which will probably have consequences for participation levels, indeed the spiritual vitality of the congregation. Now we note that some churches avoid talking about deficits by adding an additional draw on unrestricted assets to revenue. This can make sense in some situations. It also might sense, create a sense of false security within the congregation. So you see a balanced in name only column on the right where we've shown the deficit covered with assets. While you don't need to build a financial model to understand the challenge for the example mentioned, Many churches avoid looking into the future to better understand the challenges. They lose the opportunity to consider new options while they still have some time and financial resources. They live in denial about the reality of declining resources or imagine that new resources will be identified. There is a difference between faith-based hope, which helps us make changes to keep us aligned with God's purposes and magical thinking, which can keep us from entering into a necessary time of discernment. Faith-based hope is vision-driven. If hope is waning, focus on vision. Hope is not just a vision of the future. Hope is also a mandate for the present. Hope has a way of ordering our present in such a way that our present becomes congruent and consistent with our promise. And this has always been a problem with God's people. We tend to drift away from God's bold vision, replacing it with a safer, tamer vision of our own. Can we go back one, Susie? Let's see if I can do that for you. There you go. Thank you. Some perspective. When I started working for the conference in 2002, conference membership was right about 100,000. In 2018, conference membership was 56,000. United Church of Christ membership peaked in the mid-1960s. More recently, Connecticut Conference membership was plateaued at about 108,000 from 1979 to 1993.
From 1993 to 2002, we experienced a more gradual decline to about 100,000. Since 2002, the decline has been more rapid and fairly consistent from year to year. Despite membership decline, overall pledging and offerings was fairly flat until about 2014, and now we see declining giving. This is total giving for all Connecticut Conference churches. Each congregation's story is different, but many churches do not immediately reduce expenses to offset reduced giving, partly because staffing and facility expenses are sticky, if not fixed, and reductions are not easy. Deficits were often viewed as a short-term problem solved and not as a long-term structural challenge to be addressed. Churches with unrestricted assets often decide to buy time by balancing the budget with assets. Some examples of this include liquidating investments or selling property and using sales proceeds. Unfortunately, some churches also justified using restricted assets to balance the budget, despite legal prohibitions from doing so. We'll talk more about honoring donor intentions later. The way we are doing church isn't working in many settings. I would describe our way of doing church, common since World War II, as facility-based, professionally led, and Sunday morning worship centered. Short-term approaches to budget deficits typically accept that this is the right way to do church and that we can find ways to balance the budget without any fundamental changes to this approach. This will be true in some settings or true for a while longer at least. In other settings, more radical changes to facilities, staffing, and how the church gathers will need to be considered. How can you better understand what solutions might work in your setting? A financial model may help. A very short dissertation on models. Models are a selective abstraction of reality. They are not reality. Models don't provide answers. They help you to understand the problem. And more complicated models don't necessarily help you to understand the problem better. So what is the problem? When will we run out of unrestricted assets that we can use to balance the budget? Balance in quotations. Or said another way, when will we reach the fiscal cliff? All right. Can you go back, Susie? Yep. No, Ford again. Oh. Yeah. You should start with a simple model and that it may be all you need. Use just a few revenue and expense categories, the ones that are most significant to your budget. Lump everything else as other. You should also keep it simple by ignoring inflation. Keep everything in current dollars. If you only give out COLAs, you don't need salary adjustments. Aside from inflation, you need to identify the significant trends and categories in the categories you have chosen. You need to give particular attention to giving. In addition to past giving history, you'll want to take potential changes into account. Many churches have a culture of secrecy about giving that is not helpful. Perhaps you have a financial secretary who can help you create a table of giving by age. So you can see giving by age cohorts, 85 plus, 75 to 85, 65 to 75, 55 to 65, et cetera. If you have access or access to someone with access to giving data, it could be informative to look at new pledges and pledges lost on an annual basis for several years. This data may be noisy. Sometimes a pledge is not really lost. A pledger just skips a year or two. Sometimes a pledge is not really new. It is just a person that is pledging again after a break. Someone with full access to the data could tease this out. With the noise caveat, the ratio of new to lost pledges can help inform forecasts for the future. If you really had time and interest, you could also look at the ratio of pledge increases to pledge decreases, but this is probably not going to be as informative and didn't I say to keep things simple. A key thing for modeling is to divide investment income into the sustainable draw and the additional draw. So what constitutes a sustainable draw? Assuming you are invested in a por balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds, use four and a half percent of the asset balance. If we are ignoring inflation, this amount will be level unless there are additional draws. 
if there are additional draws, the sustainable amount goes down by four and a half percent of the additional draw. For example, if you have $100,000 of invested assets, the sustainable draw is $4,500 and you can project this into the future. However, if you have a deficit of $20,000 and cover this with an additional draw from investments, the sustainable draw in the next year will be $3,600, which is 4,500 less the four and a half percent of the $20,000 you used up. You'll also want to anticipate significant events, such as the retirement of staff person and the impact this might have on the budget. Once you have a basic model, you can play what if to see what the impact might be. For example, what if we can consider uh, increased rental income by leasing out some of our property? Be careful to consider all the costs associated with being a landlord, including property tax and a fund for maintenance and capital improvements. Be very careful forecasting membership growth unless you have a history of growing. This can easily slide into magical thinking. Can you go back one, Susie? Sure. No, I thought I skipped two. <laughs> All right, we'll get better at this, friends. A few words about restricted assets. Only donors can restrict the use of an asset. There are two kinds of restrictions. The first kind of restriction regards the preservation of an asset. This creates an endowment. You can only spend income and a prudent portion of the increase in the market value, investment appreciation. The principles of prudence are given in the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which was adopted in Connecticut in 2007. By the way, you can spend a prudent portion of investment appreciation, even if the donor restricted spending to interest and dividend income. The second kind of restriction regards the use of the funds. For instance, the donor may restrict the use of the gift to music ministry. The two kinds of restrictions can be combined, for instance, creating an endowment fund that will support faith formation programming. Going ahead and filling this all in. <laughs> No matter how dire the financial circumstances of the congregation become, donor restrictions are legally binding and cannot be changed without judicial approval, which is only available in limited circumstances and to a limited extent. Endowments are immortal, even if congregations are not. No matter how long a church has treated unrestricted funds as an endowment, the funds are still unrestricted. Any designation of funds made by the congregation can be changed by the congregation. Churches make two kinds of mistakes. They spend restricted funds in violation of donor instructions. They also fail to spend unrestricted funds when this is an option. Uh, this slide shows the difference between true donor created endowments and quasi endowments designated by congregations. So let's look at a model. So Susie and I have to do a little work here. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share and then you get to start a share. Do you see a spreadsheet, Susie? I do. Excellent. So, uh, the first thing I did to build this model was gather five years of history and the current year budget. You can see there are only three categories of revenue, pledges, other revenue, and the sustainable draw on investment income. And only five categories for expense, staffing, facilities, admin, program, and outreach. Pledging income has declined, but not as quickly as membership. There was some success in increasing other re revenue for a few years by increasing rental income and fundraising, but this has leveled off. 
This church uses a total return investment and spending policy to determine investment income. Expenses have been closely managed. Some staff turnover has resulted in some savings and part-time hours for some staff have been reduced. This church sold the parsonage in 2012 and set the money aside. It is invested but considered available to help balance the budget. Initially, it was hoped that the amount needed to balance the budget would decline to zero over time, but this has not been the case. After several years of drawing about $25,000 from assets to balance the budget and hoping this number would go down, the 2019 budget will require spending $36,000 from assets, mostly due to declining pledges. Some people have concluded that the budget will not balance without major changes, and some people are beginning to realize that the proceeds of the sale of the parsonage will not last forever, and some people are clueless. I've chosen to show an annual deficit, but this church actually budgets the use of assets to balance the budget, so it has been presenting a balanced budget to the congregation. So I'm going to just take a second so you see we have five years of historical data. You see the deficit line, which declined for a bit and then popped back up. And you see the draw on the assets. And so the uh, investment line and the sale of property, which has been declining. The pink numbers are the budget adopted for 2019. Blue numbers are all projections. So I did some basic analysis to make a forecast. Looking at membership, a decline of 160 people a year over the historic period of time works out to a reduction of about 32% or 8% per year. That's four annual reductions. The yellow column is an annual trend factor and I plugged in 8%, which I can easily change for what if analysis. And so what the model does is it starts with the most recent actual number and it applies the trend factor to each subsequent year. I came up with trend factors uh, for other line items. Don't get too fixated on membership and the number of pledge units. These metrics were meaningful in the past, but we may need to look at new metrics, including participants and non-pledge financial support. We can hope these metrics increase, but remember that faith-based hopes requires action towards realizing our hopes. The trend for annual pledge is about 3% increase per year, but ignoring inflation, I used 1% as an annual trend factor. If you look down now at the bottom line produced by the, the budget, uh, the model shows that the resources available from the sale of the parsonage will run out uh, in the middle of 2022, and that it would take an additional $100,000 of additional assets to keep the budget balanced through 2024. Tweaking the annual trend factors does not make a really big difference to the story. But watch this. This staff has an associate pastor. Uh, and I'm going to reduce staffing expense by $32,000, half of the associate pastor, uh, next year in 2020. Uh, now, the draw on assets goes down. And I continue to have assets available to take us further into the future. Uh, now, you can't assume that there'll be no negative consequences from cutting a position to half time, but you could consider, would you rather have a full-time position for a few years and then eliminate the position completely or move to a part-time position sooner and have the ability to sustain the position for a longer time? Now, cutting an associate position to half time is a relatively modest change in how you do church, but other churches looking at forecasts may conclude that they can't afford to keep a solo pastor full time or that they can't afford to stay in their current facilities. This may lead to consideration of more radical changes. Susie, let me throw this over to you. Okay. 
stop share. All right, and I'm going to go back to a share. All right, are you all seeing the PowerPoint again? You see it, Charlie? Yes. Good. Well, thank you for uh, walking us through financial forecasting. And now that you have some sense of how to do that, uh, you may, may ask yourself, now what? What does this mean to us as a church? Well, if the numbers, after you do some financial forecasting, come out good for you, well, that's great. If the numbers are somewhat daunting and suggest that you are at a cliff or near one in the next several years, you may be feeling a little concerned, if not a little panicky, but strangely, what you've been given is actually a gift. So let me explain what I mean by that. Perhaps up until now, your church has tried to be all things to all people. Urgency may help you focus your attention on a few essentials, coalescing the church's energies around new directions. And there's also a lot of research in the world of change management that suggests urgency is exactly what is needed to create a climate for change. Among the many change management experts is John Cotter. He studied change efforts in all kinds of organizations and discovered that creating a sense of urgency is the critical first step for effective change. Creating a er, sense of urgency for Cotter is a leadership responsibility. So it is your job as a church leader to create a sense of urgency so that the vision for change can emerge and actions can take place to live into that vision. So this is Cotter's eight step model for organizational change. Now I'll confess when I first came across this model, I was very surprised. I had always thought that vision came first. I thought if leadership had a great vision that others would catch the vision and would follow. But you see vision shows up as the third step here. Cotter's research has discovered that vision first doesn't work. He found that there are two other tasks that must be launched prior to vision and sustained along with it. And why is that? Well, human nature, complacency. The status quo is comfortable, or if not completely comfortable, at least it is known and predictable. As an aside here, change involves uncertainty and people hate uncertainty even more than they hate pain. So it takes a lot to get people to change. Without urgency, people simply continuing, continue to do what they've been doing, even though they may hear, see, and even be somewhat affected by the hazards of a changing culture around them. The world of mainline churches is just evidence of that complacency. We've known for more than 25 years that cultural and demographic changes were negatively impacting mainline church membership and attendance, but very few churches have done much to respond. So to get ourselves out of complacency, we need a shove, a shove into the future, and that shove is urgency. So urgency focuses our efforts and is an essential first step for church. And finally, urgency is a scriptural gift as well. Embedded in the summons for us to be transformed by our encounter with Jesus. Urgency is what opens us up to the work of becoming disciples and becoming the church that Jesus needs. So it may be a gift to you if your financial forecasting makes it easier for you to impart a sense of urgency. This data is information that your congregation needs to make critical decisions about its future 
before the future gobbles it up. Now the numbers may be very clear to you if you do this financial forecasting, but people respond differently to numbers. For some people, a spreadsheet of financial forecasting will simply not be helpful. It may be either confusing or worse, easily dismissed. After all, if you've been looking at some of the trends for a while, but the church has still been plugging along, you may think, well, we can just continue to plug along, God will provide. So you see the leadership task is not just putting numbers in front of people, it's also cultivating that sense of urgency. So that's gonna be the task for you as leaders, is to create a plan to raise the level of urgency in your congregation. You need most of your congregation to get the urgency in order to affect change. Not just the financial people and a few church leaders, you actually need somewhere around 60 to 80% of your voting members to get what's going on here in order for change to happen. Therefore, you will need to use every tool and technique to cultivate the sense of urgency. And it will take some time and some care to accomplish that. In other words, you will need to do some leadership thinking and planning about creating the sense of urgency. And you'll wanna do it in a variety of ways. For instance, you could use a number of tools such as graphs. Uh, Charlie showed us some of those. Some of those work better than numbers for some people because they're very visual. Um, you might want to think about creative skits that you could do during announcements or during part of a sermon series. Or you may want to collect stories of churches from around our area, other churches that have either faced severe challenge for both good or for bad conclusions. Or you may want to think about collecting other articles from a wider swath, articles that speak to the changing church landscape, the rise of the nuns and duns. And you might want to use images to convey the challenge and the hope of what is ahead of us. Images are things that can communicate so much more on a variety of levels than simple uh, words or other things. So this is an example of a picture that evokes some tone and tenor to it uh, that you'd struggle to communicate in other ways. And here too we see uh, communication by using images, uh, raising a question about the future of the church and what its trajectory might be. Another tactic might be to evoke the urgency by enacting something of a challenge that is coming up for your church. This can be a great way to have people experience the consequence of inaction, but doing this needs to be done with careful planning and a light touch. So if you're considering doing a coffee hour with no coffee or something like that, you need to plan and communicate it in advance and do it with a light touch, but understand how you can connect that to a sense of urgency for the whole church. Another approach might be to send your people out to other churches some Sunday to experience the challenges and gifts of other congregations, both UCC churches and maybe some churches from other denominations. What about closing church some Sunday and having everyone go to a curated list of say 15 churches in the area and then come back for the next Sunday with some observations and learnings. Remember to use a variety of delivery times and techniques as well to convey urgency. Smaller congregations, I'm sorry, smaller conversations where there is some give and take may make more of the information stick. And you might want to put your youth on the job of creating a video, for example, that illustrates urgency. Or what about using a survey to get some feedback on how your urgency communication is working? A quick three question survey that you could set up on SurveyMonkey might be a very helpful tool both to impart the message and to get feedback. 
For instance, what do you think about the state of our current church could be one of the questions. While at first blush, a survey seems like a one-way communication, it is actually a very effective two-way communication. You'll find out how your urgency program is going, and many of your church members will hear something because they're answering the survey. Hear something they might not have heard otherwise. It will also help to locate your church's challenge in the larger story. This can be done by looking for the many articles and scholarly magazines, trade publications, popular media about the changing demographics of the church. The larger story also helps to prevent us from blaming anyone. Rather, it engages us all in a call to responsibility, that is, the ability to respond. One minister in the Connecticut conference did this locating of her church's story in the larger experience of the culture very well by feeding her leaders articles on the demographics of church change over the course of several years, which prepared the church to act quickly when they needed to sell the building and reshape their ministry. Now we'll be sending you tomorrow some of these resources. I have a list of links that may be helpful articles for you all. The message is important, but also the messenger is important. If someone has been known to be a pessimistic voice over 15 years, others may just not hear them. For that reason, add someone to your leadership team who has been known to be sunny and optimistic. Such a person can help ground this urgency and biblical hope, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. Now, I was having a conversation about this with some clergy recently when I actually misspoke, and I coined this goofy term, peptimistic, and it may be that being peptimistic, that is peppy, that urgency is asking us to change in a holy way, being peptimistic may actually be just what's called for at this moment. Remember that you want to start, start with a team approach and make sure that you have your team gathered together to create this program of urgency communication. This comports again with that Cotter model. Uh, it helps to get your creative thinkers in the congregation to partner with you and co-lead with you in developing the sense of urgency. That's a win-win to get your creative people in, on board. Not only do you use their skills, but it will also help them to own the urgency themselves. And when you get them along, you'll get some of their friends to come along too. And while you're creating that climate for change by cultivating a sense for, of urgency, you can also begin the work of forming the powerful guiding coalition and uh, starting to think about planning to create a vision. You'll want people who can grasp the challenge ahead and can communicate that challenge to others. And you'll want people who know change can be hard, but who are excited about the possibilities and excited to create the new. Now we'll be talking more about creating vision in later sessions in September and October. But in the meanwhile, um, think about the skills of your leaders and using them according to their strengths, raising the level of urgency, having the team communicate this is a multiplier effect. And we also, as your conference staff, are really happy to help you with resources along the way, key communication pieces, however we can be helpful. We can help your church understand both that you are not alone and that unless you do something about effective change soon, some of our churches may end up out of business and leaving the mantle of the holy Jesus following work to other churches. It's really important, as Charlie mentioned, to help people understand that magical thinking or returning to the old ways of doing things is not a solution. If it were, we wouldn't be where we are right now. This can show up in all kinds of forward nostalgia 
by which I mean the sense that we that there's something that we used to do that we should do again because it's associated with a sense of well-being, albeit one that's not completely recoverable. Now these quotes are things I hear in churches time and time again. They are essentially efforts to do what we used to do, hoping for different results. It might be helpful to actually start by just getting these out, to name them up front and to say, these are gonna be non-solutions for us because we are in a very significant time of change and that demands change from us. The evidence is pretty clear. While a few old model churches, 2.0 churches in the language that some of us have been using may survive, most will not without some change. And those that do will have to do the work of meaningful change. Fear may make us want to go back to Egypt, but God is calling us through the wilderness to forms of faithfulness that we need yet to create. It was a long and labor-filled time for the Israelites, and it will be for us too. We need to talk more about mission models and leading change in later sessions. We'll definitely get to that. But in the meanwhile, a part of urgency creation is to face our golden calves that we create, the nostalgia for the past, and then to move on to the work ahead. So here's the really important place to land. We want to do the work of urgency in the full context of biblical hope. This is an urgent need to change because God asks that the body of Christ be flexible and adaptive. What we have made normative in churches is, as Charlie alluded to, nothing like what Jesus following looked like 100 or 500 years ago, and hardly anything like what the first followers of Jesus did to be the body of Christ. For example, Jesus never walked into a building with few pews facing a communion table. He was on the road with people in their daily travels. Urgency and hope are not counter to one another. They actually go hand in hand. Our hope is that the good that Jesus can accomplish through us is for the glory of the divine and the healing of the world. Our urgency is that we are not yet adequately, adequately equipped to do this work in this time and place. Biblical hope combines our will with the will of God and our path to the journey of Jesus. A hope researcher, C.R. Snyder, talked about hope as being both willpower and way power. Now it may be urgency is a huge supplier of willpower in the sense that it will help us to understand that things are untenable the way they are and cannot stay the same. Willpower is juiced by the voice of the one crying in the wilderness that we are supposed to turn around and prepare because the time of the divine is at hand. Way power is knowing a created clarity around vision that we will discuss in subsequent sessions. Biblical hope is trusting that God has prepared our future for us and that God will keep us company as we are on our way, even though it will be a difficult path willpower and way power. One final word about all this. Remember how I slipped in that you may need to devote some time, some three, six months to do nothing but create a sense of urgency? Well, I meant it. Try everything, do it twice, then the say the same things over and over again because when you are really tired and ready to make yourself crazy, some people will finally be hearing it for the first time. So friends, Jesus is calling us to consider moving out of our comfort spaces and back into a more flexible, adaptive way of being community and bringing hope to others. 
We hope that this evening's event has been a helpful start to you and we're looking forward to the next two sessions. In just a minute, we'll take questions, but just a quick summary of our main points here. Do a financial forecast. Try to understand where you are in relationship to that cliff. Treat it as a tool to create urgency. Develop a team for a multi-month, multi-strategy, urgency-creating initiative and stay grounded in biblical hope. We are here to help in ways that we can and to be praying with you and working with you to make this come to fruition. So now it is your turn and you may ask questions to us of several different ways. One of them is that you can just type them into the uh, chat box or you can use the Q&A box as well. Um, and uh, you can also raise a hand. Uh, if you have a complicated question, we might even be able to give you voice and uh, take your questions that way. Susie, Paul, yeah. Paul Goodman asked if we're sharing the slides and if the recording is going to be available. I believe we can share the slides and make the recording available. That is right. We are intending to upload the recording onto our website as an ongoing resource um, if we decide it's uh, good enough quality. Um, and we definitely will make the slides. And as I said, I have a list of some uh, links to articles that may be helpful as well that I will be sending out tomorrow. A question came in ahead of time from uh, Margaret about restricted gifts and what to do if you're documentation is sketchy uh, about a restricted gift uh, and uh, if churches have successfully made restricted gifts unrestricted gifts. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'll say a couple of things quickly. Uh, there are no restricted gift police uh, that are going to look over your shoulder to make sure restrictions are enforced. Now we have a obligation to honor donor intent when that intent is clear and documented. Uh, however, if there's no longer any documentation, uh, you can decide or discern that the money is functionally unrestricted. The only thing that would stop you from doing that was if somebody could produce documentation to the contrary. Now, again, this is a discernment process because if you in good faith believe that the historical records and traditions of the church indicate that this is restricted, you don't want to take that lightly. Uh, there is a process uh, for uh, terminating small trusts uh, that's under 150,000 in Connecticut, uh, and you can go to a probate court and have the restrictions removed uh, and I have worked with multiple churches to remove those restrictions. Uh, you can also try to restate restrictions that are impractical anymore. Again, you would petition the court. In most cases, you probably don't need an attorney to do this. Uh, and I don't have a specific example that we've worked with, but there is one kind of in process that may shed some light on this. Uh, so that's a few things I can say uh, about that. The next question is, is rental income, which is used 100% for church operations, subject to the Connecticut property taxes? Episodic rental income where, say, you have a group that comes in and uses space weekly is not subject to property tax. If you carve out a section of your building and you lease it so that you have a tenant, or if you take a parsonage and uh, rent that out, that portion of your property that is leased becomes subject to Connecticut property taxes or your town property taxes. It does not matter whether you lease it to a nonprofit or for-profit, the act of leasing the space makes it subject to property tax. Uh, there's also income tax issues. Generally speaking, rental income is not subject to income tax. Uh, unless it's based on debt financed or mortgage property, in which case you need to consult an attorney or an accountant. 
And then the next question is, I want to understand clearly, are restricted funds able to be drawn down at the 4.5% rate when, are, when you are using the total return investment approach? Remember, there are two kinds of restrictions. Uh, when you have an endowment, which is a fund that is intended to be uh, sustained forever, uh, you're only allowed to harvest a sustainable portion because your obligation is to maintain purchasing power over time. So uh, for a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds, most people are comfortable that somewhere between 4% and 5% annually is a sustainable spending rate. The Connecticut Conference uses 4.5%, uh, which is fairly common there are some organizations moving to lower spending rates. Any other questions? I should say that if it's not an endowment fund, it's just a restricted fund. Somebody has made a gift and said, this is for the music program. If it's not an endowment, you can spend 100% of that money so long as it's spent on music programs. Well, if there are no more questions, I just want to alert you to what is ahead. We will be talking on, oh, I just got another question. Um, do you have specific examples of ways churches have successfully developed an understanding of urgency? Yeah, so the, um, uh, I think we have a couple of examples within the Connecticut Conference of Churches that have um, successfully developed a sense of urgency and therefore undertaken rather significant change. Uh, we've had a couple of churches that have sold buildings over the last couple of years and moved their ministries um, into either rental spaces or a rent back agreement. Uh, we have an example of a church recently that sold its building and is taking some time to reconsider its ministry in a new location and then we'll do a restart. We also have a church that made a decision to um, uh, I'm trying to remember the uh, official language of this, Susan Murtha. Transplant. Uh, I'm sorry? Transplant. Transplant, thank you. To transplant. Um, and uh, members went to several uh, different churches, but um, to, to uh, sort of a curated list of, of churches in particular. So those are some examples of churches that were able to successfully develop an understanding of urgency and um, change the model of ministry. And it's likely we can make connections for you <clears throat> with other churches uh, as you go down uh, your particular uh, road into the future. We also are seeing some churches that may not be facing the cliff quite as soon, but have developed a sense of urgency to uh, enable themselves to do a little bit more experimentation about different approaches to ministry. Uh, and I'm starting to collect those kinds of uh, stories, um, churches that are experimenting with, say, a theology on tap kind of um, uh, conversation that they're doing in local pubs, um, dinner conversations. Um, there is a church that's uh, doing a dinner church once a month and not doing uh, Sunday morning that, that once a month. Susie ended by saying that we're here to help you, and we are. Uh, you can reach either of us by uh, email or phone with follow-up questions. Uh, I know that I have spoken on occasion to uh, uh, many of the people that are registered for this webinar, and we'll be happy to continue to do so in the future. I also wanted to point out that our um, general association this year will feature uh, Angie Thurston and Sue Phillips from howwegather.org. Uh, if you go to howwegather.org, there's some really interesting resources there about how millennials are shaping their gatherings for 
spiritual purposes, for community purposes, and for service purposes. Uh, they'll be with us and we will have some time to experiment with some ideas that you might bring to try to probe and prototype them in your local church. So that's definitely worth coming to and the registration is now open for that. Thank you all so much for spending some of your evening with us. We would welcome any feedback you would send us by email about how we might improve uh, both some technical things we're, we're aware that we want to smooth out, but if you have suggestions for us, we'd really appreciate that. And also if you have some particular questions that you'd like us to address in one of the future ones, we have outlines at this point, but we haven't written the scripts yet. So we'd be delighted to hear what will be helpful to you. Thank you again. Have a good evening and God bless you.